Thank you very much, Inez. Um, I want to greet each and every one of you this evening and tell you uh, how happy I am to be here with you uh, at UC Davis. And I want to thank Inez uh, Hernandez Avila uh, for my wonderful um, invitation to be here. Uh, she is the chair and a professor here with the Native American Studies uh, Department. And I'm very grateful also to the many uh, dis distinguished sponsors of this forum this evening. And I do want to take a moment to uh, uh, provide my respects and uh, greetings, you know, to the tribal people that are here today, uh, California tribes. It's wonderful to be here in your uh, beautiful homeland. Uh, and I am very honored to uh, be here at UC Davis, and I want to uh, uh, just say how, how moved I was, you know, on uh, Chris Peter's uh, wonderful and very powerful uh, remarks. I think it's very important to hear uh, the uh, perspective, indigenous perspective, the very moving and very powerful uh, words and thoughts that you had. Uh, Chris, I appreciate them. Um, and I have to acknowledge my good friend, uh, Mr. Peters, you know, he, uh, as the president and CEO of the Seventh Generation Fund, his uh, lifetime achievements as uh, one of our nation's uh, leading uh, Native American uh, grassroots activists is, is just uh, uh, very, uh, very wonderful to see. And, and I just can't tell you how many uh, tribal and uh, indigenous communities across the country have uh, greatly benefited, you know, from uh, uh, the work of the Seventh Generation Fund over the years. And I think that uh, Chris's uh, career as, a, as an activist and as a powerful indigenous voice, uh, uh, in my view, makes him an icon uh, of the, uh, you know, Native uh, rights movement here in the United States and certainly a a role model, I think, for our younger people um, that are coming up, you know, coming through the uh, Native American Studies uh, program uh, that, uh, you know, you have to take a soldier stance, it seems to me, and just not take things for granted and have no fear to, uh, to uh, advocate, you know, on behalf of your cultures and your communities, you know. Chris is a wonderful role model, so I'm I'm grateful uh, for, for you, Chris, and it's certainly my privilege to share, uh, share this uh, forum with you tonight. And um, I just want to commend uh, the university this evening. I think it is very, very timely uh, to critically examine the doctrine of discovery and the larger body of the law of colonialism. Um, especially today, you know, uh, here in North America, because I think that we stand at a juncture, a historic uh, juncture um, uh, between two vastly different ways of defining indigenous rights in the 21st century. As I said at my book lecture today, uh, we can, uh, at, from this vantage point, uh, or a crossroads, if you will, we can clearly see uh, two uh, uh, very complex and comprehensive legal frameworks for defining indigenous rights in the world today. Uh, the first framework is this existing uh, uh, one that we're in now that is established by federal Indian law, which uh, derives from uh, our law of colonialism adapted to the American setting. Um, and then we can see out on the horizon coming our way a brand new uh, human rights framework for defining indigenous rights, uh, one that has been given to us uh, by the United Nations uh, in uh, General Assembly in the year 2007. Uh, which after more than 20 years in the making uh, approved the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And um, that uh, declaration um, creates a human rights framework for defining indigenous rights uh, 
the full range of indigenous rights, uh, any kind of uh, uh, self-determination rights, a right to development, right to transmit culture, religious freedom, self-government, indigenous institutions, it's all addressed in this UN framework uh, based upon a far more just value system uh, from uh, notions of justice, uh, notions of uh, good faith, notions of democracy, notions of equality, notions of non-discrimination, uh, value, the value of good faith and cooperation. These are the modern values that underpin this new framework that we can see out on the horizon. Um, and so uh, as we stand at that crossroads, I think uh, um, we're at a historic juncture, it seems to me, as far as being able to see these two comprehensive frameworks for defining indigenous rights. And, uh, as I stated at my book lecture today, um, I think that our challenge of our generation is to uh, implement this new framework, to try to uh, synthesize the very best features from our existing legal framework and merge it uh, in this brand new human rights framework to create a new uh, paradigm, as uh, Chris has mentioned, to fashion a brand new, uh, more just uh, framework for defining indigenous rights in the United States. Um, and I think that uh, uh, as we set about that task, that it is very important to um, examine, uh, critically examine the uh, uh, federal Indian law doctrine of discovery as it exists in North America today. I think it's very important uh, to all of us to clearly see this doctrine uh, as an unjust uh, legal uh, principle that shapes uh, indigenous rights uh, in North America, not only in the U.S., but also in Canada and other uh, former colonies around the world. Uh, to uh, be a, an unjust principle that basically defines our polit political status, defines our land rights, uh, and I think it's important uh, to, to, uh, for all of us to know and understand that this is an international legal principle uh, that was brought to North America by Europeans uh, during the colonial era and used by them uh, to define their relationships with indigenous peoples in the New World. And um, we got to understand also at the same time that this legal doctrine or this legal principle uh, carries a very significant anti-indigenous uh, function uh, because it serves to uh, legitimize uh, colonialism providing the lens to, uh, through which to define our, our land rights. Uh, but um, we also um, uh, need to understand, it seems to me, when looking at this doctrine, and I want to spend a little time uh, talking more detail about it, but uh, it, it has had an enormously important and pervasive influence on federal Indian law today. That is our current framework for Native American rights in the United States, um, as well as in Canada and Australia, New Zealand, uh, and uh, all of the uh, former British colonists, uh, colonies around the world. Uh, a very uh, pervasive uh, legal influence that, that can still be seen in the legal uh, regimes of these former colonies to this very day. Uh, professor uh, Robert Miller, from uh, the uh, uh, law, law professor from uh, Lewis and Clark Law School, has uh, written very much about this legal doctrine. Several law review articles uh, comparing or discussing the uh, influence that it has had on federal Indian law uh, 
and uh, exploring uh, how this doctrine was used and uh, utilized in, in Canada and colonies, British colonies around the world as a very uh, significant uh, part of the legal uh, regimes of these, of these uh, present day nations. And um, I want to go into this doctrine, but, but just to say here at the outset is that uh, um, this doctrine of discovery, and, uh, which is one of the foundational principles of the current legal framework for Native American rights in federal Indian law, um, that I feel like we've uh, tried to make the very best of this legal framework here in the United States for many decades. Uh, and in the modern era of federal Indian law, uh, which has witnessed our tribal sovereignty movement, you know, since 1970. Uh, and we have, I think, to our credit, uh, made the best of that framework. Uh, we have witnessed, as Professor, a law professor Charles Wilkinson has said, uh, uh, striking nation building advances that have given rise to the modern Indian nation that we uh, see here in the U.S. today. And so this, this uh, framework, it does, uh, to be fair, you know, has some very strong protected features uh, to it, to be sure. Um, and I'm thinking principally here the uh, doctrine of inherent uh, tribal sovereignty and the protectorate uh, principle uh, that was described in, in uh, the Wooster v. Georgia uh, Supreme Court decision in 1833. And these are very protective features, probably the very best that can be found in any Western nation as far as defining indigenous rights. And uh, I think during our modern era, we, we have tried to coax the courts uh, to uh, enforce these uh, protective features that are found in our existing legal framework. Uh, but our uh, legal framework also has a dark side to it, a number of nefarious uh, legal doctrines that were embedded into uh, federal Indian law by the Supreme Court, uh, uh, beginning with the Johnson v. McIntosh decision that I want to talk about and uh, other uh, Supreme Court cases that have uh, borrowed from uh, the law of colonialism. Uh, notions of uh, plenary power, uh, notions of guardianship, um, notions of discovery, notions of conquest, just war, uh, all uh, picked uh, from the uh, international uh, law of colonialism many uh, years ago that were embedded into federal Indian law and uh, still uh, hold sway, I guess, as good law here in the United States today. Um, <clears throat> but I feel that um, a uh, race of people can only advance so far in their aspirations under an unjust legal framework. And uh, that's certainly true. That I think that was certainly true for black America. Uh, uh, living under the Plessy v. Ferguson uh, framework uh, uh, created by the Supreme Court in, in 1896, uh, uh, establishing the law of segregation through the uh, separate but equal doctrine. And uh, black America lived under that doctrine for uh, all the way till 1955 and tried to make the best of it. Uh, the NAACP, which was founded in the year uh, 1910 uh, with the goal of bringing equality under the law, spent most of that, uh, most of that period of time uh, actually litigating to enforce the separate but equal doctrine, taking the position that, um, that our schools and public institutions have to truly be separate but equal and focusing on the most protective feature. That is, they have to be equal. And if they're not equal in every respects, then they have to be shut down and integrated. 
Um, but in 1950, they came to the same crossroads that we're at today, you know, when the Supreme Court in a trilogy of cases agreed with them and uh, said, you're right, uh, we have to be separate but equal, truly equal, and if not, uh, uh, the schools have to be integrated. Um, and at that point, they came to that crossroads and said, you know, we've made the best we can of this legal regime. Uh, we can now litigate from here to eternity uh, against every single school and public institution in the country, uh, which would be like emptying one cup at a time from the ocean. Or we can turn and have a frontal assault on the legal regime itself and, uh, and uh, challenge the constitutionality of that legal doctrine the separate but equal doctrine. And so that's what they did. And four years later in the Brown v. Board of Education, they, uh, they overturned that doctrine and created a brand new uh, framework for uh, the right of equality under the law for black America. And so um, I think that um, we, we in uh, Indian country uh, now stand at that same crossroads, you know, and it may be that we have stalled out um, in our aspirations, our indigenous aspirations for uh, self-determination at the very doorsteps of self-determination as that's defined by modern international human rights law. Um, and now maybe we have to look at our take a hard look at our legal framework and uh, uh, take a soldier's stance and, and perhaps try to uh, attack some of these uh, Supreme Court decisions that uh, comprise the dark side of federal Indian law to see if we can't get uh, the Supreme Court to overturn them just like uh, the Supreme Court overturned Plessy v. Ferguson in that landmark case of Brown v. Board of Education. But in order to do that, we first have to look to what, what would be our new framework and I think uh, that we want to uh, stride towards and I think that that's been given to us as a gift from the United Nations in this UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I believe that it comprises a lifeline to us here in the United States uh, in that we can now see this brand new legal framework for defining our rights uh, in a human rights framework. And when we talk about a human rights framework, this is a very radical proposition because in federal Indian law, uh, there's no human rights uh, precepts, there's no human rights uh, legal principles, there's no human rights uh, discourse that you can find in any of our landmark Supreme Court cases, but rather they all say, we can't look to justice when we're defining Native American rights. We can't, uh, we can't concern ourselves with morality here or debate whether, whether this is right or wrong or just or unjust. We simply just have to take the law i.e. the law of colonialism to def when defining Native American rights. And so that approach uh, leads to a amoral body of law that is bereft of the human rights principle that, uh, that uh, uh, we see you know, in the Declaration of Independence and some of the other cases concerning other peoples. But we, we, uh, as Native Americans, are governed under an amoral uh, legal framework. And um, so I think that uh, it's very timely to uh, uh, take a critical look at that framework at this point in history and uh, uh, try to inject some of the human rights uh, considerations, you know, that obtain for the rest of humanity. Uh, and to apply those norms uh, in the context of indigenous peoples today, which is precisely what this UN Declaration does. So what I want to do is uh, basically two things with you here is, uh, first I want to uh, kind of review our old framework for defining 
uh, Native American rights in federal Indian law. And then secondly, I want to uh, take a quick look at this new framework for defining indigenous rights in the world today created by this UN declaration. And so uh, uh, let me uh, turn to my uh, first task here in uh, taking a, an overview. And I'm going to brush with broad strokes here in looking at the federal Indian law framework. Uh, it's got roots uh, that are traced back to medieval times in Europe uh, that some of our scholars uh, trace uh, uh, way back into the Dark Ages, uh, in the very dawn or even before the uh, co uh, colonial era, you know, from 1492 to about 1960. Uh, then we'll look at uh, Johnson v. McIntosh and the doctrine of discovery and how that was uh, incorporated by John Marshall, the greatest chief justice of all time, kind of like Elvis. He was the greatest, he was the king, uh, and adopted uh, to the American setting. And, and actually, uh, Marshall uh, expanded the international uh, uh, doctrine of discovery for, uh, to the American setting. And he expanded and elaborated on it here in the US. Um, and then we'll take a look at um, the new framework, which uh, has its roots in modern international human rights law. By the way, as I as I has said, you know, I'm writing a book about that and how how we might go about implementing this new framework in the U.S. In my uh, forthcoming book, hope to be back with a book lecture, maybe at the law school or something like that. Um, and how this new framework uh, flatly repudiates uh, the Johnson v. McIntosh decision and this law of discovery, a uh, doctrine of discovery. There's absolutely no room for this antiquated, uh, outmoded, uh, unjust, and oppressive legal doctrine in the UN framework. And then I'd like to kind of look at some of the challenges ahead for this generation. Uh, in implementing that UN declaration uh, to move us away from uh, the law of colonialism uh, that is found uh, alive and well today in the federal Indian law framework and stride towards this new human rights framework. Uh, noting here uh, that this uh, UN declaration is not a legally binding uh, treaty, a self-enforcing enforcing treaty, but rather it's a set of uh, a declaration of uh, a minimum standards that the UN is asking every nation uh, to implement in partnership with indigenous peoples, every, every nation in the world that has indigenous peoples. Um, so let me turn to the first, uh, uh, my first task here, and I obviously uh, have to brush with very broad strokes, and I'll try to be as quick as I can. Uh, but when we look up, look at federal Indian law, many uh, uh, countries around the world that were former colonies. Um, maybe have no, uh, no uh, laws or legal principles pertaining to their indigenous peoples, that is, the native peoples who were colonized. And uh, there are either no indigenous rights uh, at all, uh, uh, or uh, the law may even be used against indigenous peoples to strip away their rights. Um, but in the United States, we have a very comprehensive body of law pertaining to indigenous peoples. And to understand that body of law and where it came from by way of a context, uh, you do have to begin with this uh, institution of European uh, colonialism, because that's, uh, it's a byproduct of European colonialism. And during that 500 uh, year period, when, uh, from 1492 to 1960, when the entire world uh, just about was uh, 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 consisted of European colonies around the world. This was a universal 
uh, worldwide phenomena, not only in the, the Western Hemisphere, but all of Africa, uh, India, most of Asia, just about all of, uh, of the Pacific uh, region, uh, the uh, circumpolar world, every place, uh, every corner was colonized. Uh, and having very uh, harsh uh, impacts on the indigenous peoples of these uh, regions across the world. But that legacy, that political uh, institution uh, has left a legacy that is still with us today in many places around the world and most clearly embedded here in North America in our legal system today, our legal system today. And this uh, as a result of uh, the law of colonialism, which upheld and sustained and rationalized the institution of colonialism uh, through early uh, notions of international law, um, the purpose uh, uh, of this nascent uh, body of uh, international law was basically to uh, govern the relations among nations of Europe. Uh, as they um, competed with one another to colonize as much of the rest of the world as possible. Uh, this body of law laid down the rules for uh, uh, colonizing uh, non-Europeans, uh, for conquering uh, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, Christianizing them, and, and for governing them. And uh, this body of law uh, was really unaccountable to indigenous peoples. It was uh, developed by and for uh, European nations um, and uh, the scope of that body of law was, was relegated only to or limited uh, to the relationships between nations and did not extend to the domestic uh, laws of, of the nations themselves and so that sort of left the indigenous peoples who had been engulfed uh, as colonies, you know, to the domestic laws of their colonizers. And um, this body of international law um, was, uh, had a, a very serious uh, anti-indigenous function in that it, uh, it, its goal was to basically make uh, the appropriation of uh, other people's lands and, and uh, cultures and, and uh, countries, you know, perfectly legal. Uh, under under notions of international law to justify the uh, acts of the dirty little acts of uh, uh, colonialism and so it did have a very distinct anti-indigenous function and uh, the attributes of this law of uh, colonialism uh, all of which have found their way uh, into our domestic legal regime uh, include this doctrine of discovery that I want to talk about here in a little bit uh, doctrines of uh, conquest, the law of conquest, um, this uh, just war doctrine, uh, what, what, what are the legal ways to make war on indigenous peoples, trusteeship, that venerable institution of uh, I own your property and control your person and can do with it as I see fit, uh, very common uh, legal uh, arrangement, very handy uh, legal arrangement uh, in colonies around the world. Uh, guardianship, uh, the closely related uh, notion of guardianship to control and manage uh, our persons. Um, that you are basically looked upon as an uh, imbecile or a person suffering a legal incapacity and you have to have someone else manage your affairs. Um, a clear attribute of guardianship law of, of, of uh, colonialism around the world. And then there's these uh, ever-present notions of racism, um, the so-called white man's burden, uh, the need to colonize, uh, civilize the, the savages, uh, notions of uh, religious intolerance, uh, and uh, discriminatory attitudes, you know, with regard to the uh, rights of the person and, and land and uh, political and citizenship kinds of rights. Uh, 
very familiar features in the law of colonialism around the world. Um, and they were very uh, strongly embraced um, uh, by colonies around the world. Uh, otherwise, they would be seen as outlaw regimes, wouldn't they, uh, engaging in a series of uh, illegitimate and um, illegal acts. Um, but a lot of these uh, attributes of the law of colonialism, as I've just described, are still seen today um, as the byproducts, you know, that are still with us, you know, in former colonies around the world. And even though uh, colonialism has been repudiated, very sternly repudiated by the UN, uh, after World War II, the creation of the United Nations uh, and the worldwide decolonization uh, movement ultimately led to the uh, dismembering of the colonies, the transferring of power back to the uh, colonized peoples, usually the settlers, not the indigenous peoples. But ultimately, in 1960, the UN uh, General Assembly passed the UN uh, Decolonization Reso excuse me, Resolution that uh, urged the remaining colonies in the world to decolonize and condemned uh, uh, the institution of, of colonist, uh, colonialism as an oppressive and unjust and unwanted uh, institution. Um, so it has been um, uh, repudiated, um, and I think as, as Chris pointed out in his very excellent remarks, it's uh, an institution that's very hard on the land, you know, and, and the natural peoples that uh, live in the natural worlds around the world. I wouldn't commend that institution to any nation. Uh, but this law of colonialism has had a very uh, heavy influence on federal Indian law, which, as I mentioned, is our framework for defining indigenous rights. Um, and um, many of the sources of federal Indian law under our old framework are found in, number one, uh, about seven sources, uh, international law, treaties, the U.S. Constitution, Supreme Court decisions, uh, hundreds of federal statutes, executive orders, uh, administrative law, and also tribal law. But of all of these, um, uh, certainly international law was a heavy influence in shaping uh, the contours of federal Indian law, the whole notion of Indian treaties, inherent tribal sovereignty, the protectorate principle, all came directly from international law and adapted in whole cloth, you know, to the American setting, you know, by the Supreme Court, uh, notions of guardianship, trusteeship, notions of discovery, conquest, plenary power of Congress, uh, all came to us from international law. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we have a heavy influence that shaped uh, that framework. Johnson v. McIntosh was decided uh, by the Supreme Court in 1823, and this is the, the decision in which the U.S. Supreme Court expressly adopted the doctrine of discovery. And uh, it was used in that case to define Indian land rights of our tribal nations. And uh, essentially what the Marshall Court did in that case was it just simply uh, incorporated the international law doctrine in whole cloth and then expanded it, um, an expanded version for the United States and fitted it to the American setting. And the holding in that case, which is still good law today, was uh, in a nutshell, uh, the court held that the act of discovery by British explorers operated as a legal matter to transfer legal title to Indian land to Britain um, and then to the U.S. as its successor. And that this uh, uh, act of discovery uh, then left the tribes only with a right of occupancy. 
so that the tribe's uh, right of occupancy that could be extinguished by the government by conquest or by purchase. So the impact on the tribal landowners was to change them from uh, landowners to the, of the continent to mere tenants of the government. And so this seriously impaired the uh, land rights of indigenous peoples and uh, uh, put our tribes, uh, it was a doctrine of dispossession, if you will, um, that uh, put us on the slippery slope leading to massive land loss to where today we have less than 2% of our land holdings here. And then we also find out that this right of occupancy that the uh, court left us with, according to the Supreme Court in the Tihatan case, is not a property right at all that it can be taken or confiscated by Congress without compensating the tribes a dime. Um, then the, the court went on to uh, expand this doctrine of discovery to uh, do a second thing, and that was to equate the act of discovery with conquest. Uh, yet again, another legal fiction uh, to equate the act of seeing a coastline with conquering a continent. Uh, and so in so doing, the court implanted this uh, notion of vague, vaguely defined notions of conquest into federal Indian law. And many of the early decisions following that were very jingoistic, you know, written by uh, state and uh, federal judges that were themselves veterans of Indian wars. Uh, dripping with animosity and hostility. So we have this vaguely defined notions of conquest uh, embedded in federal Indian law. And all of this uh, still being the law of the land today. Um, and the Johnson case itself, um, we read it today. When I was a young law student in my freshman year, reading that case, um, I felt like it was an odd decision to my young mind. I think I was a sophomore in college when I read it, 1968. Um, and then in my first year of law school, it's the first case you read in property rights because all of American property derives from this case, ownership of Indian land. Um, and I thought it was an odd opinion, you know, it, it had uh, um, um, antiquated uh, notions that were being bandied about in the opinion and extended discourse on early colonial history and the uh, uh, troubling uh, descriptions of Indians as fierce uh, savages with inferior characters, inferior religions, inferior cultures, and, uh, and certainly this uh, this holding that was very odd, you know, it didn't seem to jive with me as a young person. But my law professors of the day really did not impress upon my young mind the really the enormity of the uh, of this unjust uh, miscarriage. I think of justice in that case. We all thought it was okay because it was a Supreme Court decision, um, and it must be right because it was a Supreme Court decision and it seemed to make sense, very logical. Um, and after all, written by John Marshall, the greatest uh, jurist in our nation's his legal history, in my opinion. So it must be right, but it really uh, is a miscarriage of justice because if you read the book Conquest by Law uh, by uh, Oklahoma law professor uh, Lindsay Robertson, um, he was setting about in, in the 1990s to write yet another book uh, on this storied landmark decision. Now, there's maybe almost 800 law review articles written about the Johnson case. But it wasn't until he wrote his book and his research on this book that he, uh, in Boston, I believe it was, came across a trunk in the basement of some uh, place, you know, in Boston and he found uh, a treasure trove. It was the actual litigation papers in Johnson v. McIntosh. 
And many of these documents, these were the uh, papers of the landowner, the land companies, that were trying to confirm their, uh, their title to the, this Indian land. Many of these documents were written in code. And as it turns out, uh, this uh, case uh, was uh, uh, birthed in a fraud. Uh, of a land company that fraudulently uh, had a forged document to present it to the British uh, uh, soldiers uh, purporting to authorize them to buy this Indian land, that uh, the land companies uh, went out and they uh, forum shopped to get a judge, to find a judge that was related to the plaintiff and uh, to decide their claim in court. Uh, that uh, the, the, uh, uh, that they went out and not only picked the defendant, but they picked the defendant's attorneys, told them what to say, and uh, developed a, a, fra a feigned uh, controversy. It wasn't really a real case or controversy. It was totally feigned, a made-up case that they created a uh, findings of fact, you know, that uh, favorable to the plaintiffs. And of course the defendant went along with it because his job was to take a fall. The judge played along with it. And when they got to the Supreme Court, uh, they did the same thing. They hired the other side's attorneys, told them what to say. And then, then we have a Chief Justice, John Marshall, whose family owned over 200 square miles of land, the Marshall family being a huge land speculator in uh, Indian land, uh, often land still owned and occupied by tribes. This is what was driving the economy at the time. And I don't know, the, the courthouse uh, burned down uh, where the, uh, the Marshall land records were kept. We don't know whether, at the time this opinion was written in 1823, whether the Marshall family owned 200 square miles or they didn't own any land whatsoever, which I doubt. But in either any scenario, the family had a, amassed a huge fortune, which depended on the outcome of this case. And in our modern standard says that's a judicial conflict of interest. You got to step aside and let some other judge decide that case. But Marshall didn't do it. Therefore, the case came out to preserve the Marshall fortune. Uh, so this this case uh, today, um, uh, many of us when we read it, we think it was handed down by God Himself. But actually, it was crooked as a barrel of snakes, and it's really not entitled to any precedential value except in the unpopular ethics courses that shows you bad ethics can implant bad law into our legal system. And that's the basic value of the Johnson case. It needs to be overturned, uh, uh, just like Plessy v. Ferguson uh, Need, uh, needed to be overturned. But unfortunately, it's still the law of the land here in the U.S. Um, let me end uh, really quickly now, Inez. Uh, I'm out of time pretty much here, but I wanted to just refer your, uh, 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 draw your attention briefly to this UN declaration. Uh, has anyone read it? Raise your hand if you've read the document. Wow. Wow, this is probably the most in any particular audience that I've seen. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, many in Indian country and across the country have never even heard of this document, have never read it, just now sitting down to read it and understand, you know, kind of what it says. But if you haven't read it, go download it from the internet and read it. Um, it's basically a set of minimum standards that have been drawn from the larger body of international human rights law. And these standards are supposed to be for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the world's indigenous peoples. And um, it doesn't create any new rights or special rights from indigenous peoples at all. 
but really simply interprets the existing body of larger international law and how these human rights norms ought to be interpreted and applied in an indigenous context so that we as indigenous peoples can have the same human rights that everybody else already enjoys. Uh, and so it provides the full range of indigenous rights that we aspire to here in Native America. Um, and it's uh, this UN declaration, it's part of the larger body of the UN uh, human rights system. It's currently being uh, looked at and implemented all around the world. 150 nations have uh, voted in the UN to adopt and endorse this UN declaration, including the US in the year 2010, being the last nation on, on the planet to do so. Um, and so as we stand here today, uh, the world is starting to begin implementing this, these human rights standards in nations around the world. It's supposed to be done in partnership and consultation with indigenous peoples. I think Bolivia uh, passed the law just saying we're hereby incorporating this declaration into the law of the nation of Bolivia in fell swoop like that. Uh, but I think typically I think it entails, it's supposed to entail consultation and partnership, good faith uh, in, in uh, developing this. And it's described as nation building, belated nation building. That when a lot of our free and democratic societies were being formed in these former colonies, indigenous peoples were brushed off to the side and their needs and aspirations were overlooked, marginalized, or relegated to a colonialism structure. Uh, and now, at long last, the UN is saying, decolonize that and bring indigenous peoples into the body politic with their rights as indigenous peoples intact, give them these minimum standards, and, uh, and there they will then, we will then witness the rise of human rights around the world for native people. It was 20 years in the making, the UN, uh, many of the uh, people and organizations that were involved uh, were in fact indigenous. They were pioneers, they were visionaries. Uh, we need to uh, commend them and bow to them. They've done something really good here, uh, and we are greatly indebted to them. You know, And they, they didn't lobby in the dark corners, and they didn't spend uh, uh, a lot of money. They didn't have any money to influence or bribe any of these officials like you see in the pork barrel politics that we witness from time to time in D.C. They simply went to the U.N. on their good looks alone and worked in the light of day uh, through every, uh, uh, all of the processes step by step over a 20 year period to get this declaration done and they, they, they won worldwide support for it. And I think that this uh, declaration it, it applies norms or it speeds the crystallization of other norms. And I think the promise of this declaration, will, if it's fully implemented around the world, will in fact change the world, the way that the world looks at indigenous peoples. It will create a brand new era, it seems to me. And it will allow us here in the U.S., for example, to define Native American rights as inherent human rights. By inherent, that means nobody gave them to us, that these are inalienable rights that we already had, that arose from our indigenous institutions and histories, rights that are indefeasible, that is, no nation can take them away. In that sense, they're larger than the state. That is, the U.S. could no sooner engage in slavery or terrorism or sex trafficking or uh, systematic discrimination as it could to take away our right of self-determination as defined in that uh, uh, declaration. <clears throat> 
And so uh, we can stride towards this brand new legal framework. Um, I think that um, a Johnson case certainly does not pass muster under these standards because it expressly rejects colonialism and in fact was put in place to combat the legacy of colonialism around the world. It strongly condemns racism in any form and that would include legal racism that is found in the dark side of federal Indian law. It prohibits any act of dispossession, which was what that case was all about. It uh, condemns, uh, non, uh, it, it calls for non-discrimination and equality, and that would include land rights. And it eschews conquest uh, and Non, and requires nonviolence by all nations in their relationships. And so uh, if John Marshall had to decide the Johnson case uh, in 1823 and this UN declaration were the law of the land and he had to apply it back then, we would have a vastly different outcome and no doctrine of discovery today. And so um, I think our paramount challenge is to really to stride towards this new framework uh, to coax uh, our fellow citizens and, and uh, to join us in that march. Uh, we have to begin a discourse, excuse me, I think a first step is to begin a public discourse on the nature and content of human rights for Native Americans. And our nation has never engaged in a, in a discourse of that nature before, in the same way that our nation has uh, looked at questions of slavery or uh, uh, deep soul searching about the rights, uh, denial of uh, equal protection under the laws, for example, to black America. Uh, we've never had a conversation about human rights for Native Americans, and I think that we, that's our first step to do that, and I think scholars, Native American studies programs, uh, programs like the Seventh Generation Fund, uh, to educating our tribal communities about this new framework, uh, are going to play a big role in, in uh, boning up for this uh, public discourse so that we and our tribal leaders and all of us can go to that table and educate our uh, be prepared to talk the language of human rights and uh, what is the content of human rights for Native Americans. And that then will set us upon a new path, it seems to me, charted by this uh, UN Declaration. And I think that if all of us go together and during this generation together, then uh, we can all stand in the light of justice, you know. Um, as a nation, and, and uh, so with, with that, I uh, thank you very much.